Our next speaker is Dr. Dirksen from University of Rochester. He is also a member of our scientific advisory board, has been invaluable uh, to the foundation in advising us. Um, he's also a recipient of a research grant from, from our foundation. Uh, so we really uh, work very closely with Dr. Dirksen and um, I think his talk is gonna be incredibly helpful for all of us to understand what exactly is going on at the level of the muscle cell with calcium, the ryanidine receptor, and trying to answer the basic question is why are people with RY1 myopathy weak? What is wrong with the muscle? Why is it not acting in the way it should? So uh, thank you very much, Bob, for being here. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, I thought I would start by asking you to imagine with me that you wake up in the morning and go down uh, to the kitchen, have breakfast, and you have to go to work or run some errands, so you grab your keys and hop in the car, put the keys in the ignition, turn the ignition, and it doesn't start. You try it again, it doesn't start again. And after a moment of anger and frustration, you try to figure out exactly what the problem is. Why won't the car start? So what are some reasons why the car wouldn't start? Anybody? No gas, right. So I have a teenage daughter who's 19 years old, stays out till 2 in the morning, comes home and never puts gas in the car. This could be absolutely exactly what would happen at my house. What else could go wrong? Dead battery, dead battery right. Maybe the battery's dead or the alternator's not working, which charges the battery. What else? The starter won't work, right. Exactly, the starter won't work. There, there could be a problem with the computer in, in these newfangled cars these days. So there are a lot of problems, right? And you may not know what the issue is. You might be able to figure it out yourself, but you may not know. So you take the car to your mechanic, and your mechanic is trained to understand the ins and outs of the car, all the pieces and how they work together and how they make the car start and do its job to drive around. So you use, you use the mechanic who understands the mechanisms of how this thing works to diagnose the problem, figure out what's not working, and then fix it. I'm a muscle physiologist. I'm interested in being a muscle mechanic. I want to know all the details of how the muscle works and so that we can understand when something goes wrong, like when RYR1 myopathy, if something's gone wrong with the RYR1, why? And how can we understand what's wrong with it and that knowledge will allow us to begin to understand the disease and why things are dysfunctional and to begin to develop therapies. So that's, the, that's where I come from. Uh, I've been working on R1 myopathy since I started my own lab 20 years ago in about 1996. And Jim showed a really nice slide of the history. I think in 1989 or so, the, the R1 was cloned by Andy Marks, who's going to be speaking later, as well as two other groups in, in Toronto and, and Japan. And then two years later, it was linked to, to uh, malignant hyperthermia in humans. And then two years after that, in 1993, they had the first um, RYR1 myopathy, central core disease, linked to RYR1. And in 96, when I started my lab, there were actually four mutations that were known to cause RYR1 myopathy. And I naively decided I was going to solve this disorder by studying those four mutations. Well, Fast forward uh, 20 years, and now we have over 300 known disease-causing mutations. And with the advent of, of uh, exome sequencing and uh, whole gene sequencing and prevention genetics, uh, we're now finding that the incidence of mutations in RYR1 is maybe one in a thousand or more. Um, not all of those are disease-causing. Many of them are benign. Some of, so we have to figure out which ones are important. But so the whole molecular genetics of the disease has really exploded. But I'm going to take you on a short tour of what uh, RYR1 does in muscle and, and how it's dysfunctional and how that helps us to understand the disease and to come up with therapies, which hopefully the, the subsequent speakers will talk a little bit more about. I've structured the talk along three questions. Uh, why is the control of intracellular calcium levels in skeletal muscle so important? How does RYR1 control calcium levels in muscles? And how do mutations in RYR1 alter the proper control of calcium levels in skeletal muscle and ultimately lead to the myopathy? 
We have to start with um, what muscle is. It's a voluntary, uh, uh, muscle is a voluntary activity. Uh, we can decide that we want to move or, or stand up or walk around. Uh, it starts in the brain and the nerves come down and um, actually make contact with individual muscle cells. And in this case is somebody who's going to be writing. So the nerves are coming down and activating the muscles of the hand or the fingers to do very fine uh, movements. Um, also, the, the nerves could come down to the leg muscles for standing or walking, but they're driven by signals coming from the nerve. Um, and if we zoom in a little bit more closely, you can see here's a nerve that is uh, coming down and making contact in a specialized region we call the neuromuscular junction, where the nerve and the muscle uh, come together. And there's a, a signal that crosses this uh, synapse or this gap. Uh, that uh, activates an action potential in the surface membrane of the muscle cell, which then uh, transmits down the muscle fiber um, uh, membrane and into the specialized uh, invagination of the surface membrane. Uh, the action potential travels down there, which we call the transverse tubule system. And in there, flanked on both sides, is the sarcoplasmic reticulum shown in blue. And that's where the ryanidine receptor is. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is a storage capacity. It holds all the calcium in there. It keeps it kind of like a battery, a, a potential energy. The calcium is stored in there, the muscle is relaxed, and we need to release it to the myofibrils underneath to cause contraction. And the ryanidine receptor is that gatekeeper that keeps the calcium in the storage compartment when we need to be relaxed, but opens and releases that calcium into the cytoplasm when we need to um, um, contract and make force. So if we take a, a, another look at this, here's the nerve coming down onto the muscle. We have the synapse between the at the neuromuscular junction. Um, there's a release of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. That activates the action potential that goes down this transverse tubule system. And as you can see, um, there are two really critical proteins here at this junction, which um, are defined here as DHPR. Sorry for the terminology, but this is what it is. It's the dihydropyridine receptor and the RYR1, which is the type 1 ryanidine receptor. The dihydropyridine receptor is in that outside membrane, the T-tubule membrane, and it's connected, as you can see, by a little spring coil here to the RYR1, which is that gatekeeper for calcium that's keeping calcium stored in the SR here. And the muscle myofilaments, which actually do the force generation, are down here. They're waiting for calcium uh, to contract. And the more calcium we release on there, the stronger the muscle's going to be. So if we have very little calcium coming down, we're going to have weakness. And that's going to be one of the underlying themes that the RYR1 mutations is they are not providing enough calcium to cause contraction. So in the resting state, um, the RYR1 channels are closed. The calcium stays stored in that capacity compartment away from, sequestered away from the myofilaments. So the calcium levels out in, in the cell here are low and the myofilaments are relaxed. They're not contracted. Oops, that's a, um, a Pokemon. Do, do anybody know which Pokemon this is? Yeah, <laughs> Charmander, right. So do, do any of your kids play Pokemon Go? Yeah, I, how many of you play Pokemon Go? Yeah, yeah, it's the same people. So my, my daughter said, you have to have Pokemon Go in your seminar. So I put, so let, let me capture Pokemon Go, and then we can move on with the talk. Okay. So now in, in the contracted state, okay, so we've had our brain that said we want to contract this muscle. And we sent an action potential down uh, that nerve fiber, and we've released the acetylcholine to activate the action potential in the surface membrane, which then rapidly transmits down the T-tubule membrane and activates those DHPRs, dihydropyridine receptors, to change their orientation and swing open that gate. Now the gate is open. The calcium can be released from that storage compartment and sprinkled down onto the myofilaments. So under this condition, the RYR channels are open because the dihydropyridine receptor has done so. The calcium is being uh, released or emptying from the store, and it's beginning to act. Um, and it's increasing the levels in the cytoplasm, and it's acting the myofilaments to cause contraction. The more calcium release, the more will contract. And muscle can do varying levels of force by 
generating more or less calcium. So when you have to have more force, these receptors are going to be stimulated to generate more calcium being released into the cytoplasm. So that communication between the DHPR and the ryanidine receptor is hypothesized to be this kind of plunger model where uh, instead of showing that, that coil, uh, I'm showing it as basically the DHPR has this positive charge that's sensitive to the voltage or the action potential, and it's plugging that ryanidine receptor in the nearby um, sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the calcium is stored here inside the SR. I'm not showing the rest of the membrane, but it's kind of stored in here. And so during an action potential, what happens is that DHPR moves and translocates away so that calcium can now be released from the, the store into the cytoplasm. And that's, that communication between those two proteins is what is disrupted in our wire one myopathy, whether it's autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. The way in which this works is disrupted. So we needed to understand first how it works before we can understand um, how it's dysfunctional. So I, I think of EC coupling as uh, intelligent design of a toilet uh, in muscle. And let me try to make this analogy for you. So we're all very familiar with a toilet. The toilet has a tank that's full of calcium. It's a potential energy to, to flush uh, the bowl. Um, and the communication, the plunger communication between the DHPR and the ryanidine receptor is, is analogous to the handle on the toilet um, connected with that chain to the flapper of the RYR1, which is a hole, that when you pull the DHPR, which is an action potential, and you open up the flapper, now the calcium, which is the water in the storage tank or the SR, can go through the hole and go into the cytoplasm and cause a, a, a nice uh, a contraction or a flushing event in, in here. So if the storage tank is not full of calcium, then you're not going to have a very strong flush or you're not going to have a very strong contraction. And that's one of the things, well, that's what we're going to, one of the mechanisms is that this flapper is not uh, tight, it's leaky. And if you've ever had a toilet that's leaky, you hear it, you know, going all the time, and if you try to flush a leaky toilet where the, where the uh, tank is not full, you don't get a very strong flush. And that's very analogous to what happens in RYR1 myopathy is you have this weak release of calcium and a weak contraction. So I think we've answered then the first two questions. Why is controlling intracellular calcium levels so important in skeletal muscle? The answer is it's to increase calcium to drive muscle contraction uh, needed to produce force or for muscle to do work or to ambulate. Um, and more calcium will give us a stronger contraction. How does RYR1 control calcium levels in muscles? It does so because it's that gatekeeper. It's the flap. Uh, it, it maintains the calcium in the store under resting conditions, but when we need it to contract, it's opened by the dihydropyridine receptor to release the calcium and activate the contractile machinery. So then we get, now we're the mechanic and we understand how the car works, but now we want to understand what's gone wrong, why we can't start the car, or how do mutations in r one alter the proper control of calcium and skeletal muscle and ultimately lead to the myopathy. So you've probably heard of a number of different muscle diseases. Some of you may have been told that you have certain, like multiple sclerosis, or they don't really understand the different diseases of, of the neuromuscular system. Um, there, multiple sclerosis is a loss of myelin from the, the, the motor nerves that, that innervate, and so the motor nerves don't work, so it's really a nerve disorder. There are autoimmune diseases against calcium channels in the nerve or those receptors that receive the acetylcholine on the, on the muscle side that cause myasthenias, uh, Lambert-Eaton or myasthenia gravis. Those are neuromuscular disorders. There's also myotonias and paralysis. Myotonia is when the muscle stays contracted and it won't relax when it's supposed to, it just maintains contraction. Or periodic paralysis is sometimes intermittent. These individuals have paralysis of their muscles and they can't walk or they can't move their arms because of paralysis. And those are due to mutations in the channels that make action potentials. 
But we're focusing here on RYR1 myopathy. These are mutations in RYR1 uh, that lead to diseases like malignant hyperthermia and RYR1 myopathy. And then, of course, there's also uh, diseases of the myofilaments uh, that lead to like myofibular myopathy and nemolin myopathy. As I said over the course of the last 20 years or so, the uh, number of mutations linked to this disorder is, has, has increased precipitously. There are over uh, several hundred of mutations. They're spread throughout the, the gene um, within the cytoplasmic region of the Ryan receptor, also the pore region of the ryanidine receptor. We have um, these mutations in generally uh, alter the way in which the dihydropyridine receptor and ryanidine receptor interact. And I've tried to show, um, just summarize about 20 years of work on this simple slide uh, showing how these two proteins are interacting with this coiled uh, mechanical interaction uh, that couples the DHPR to the ryanidine receptor. A number of studies, ours and, and others included, have shown that many of the mutations, particularly in the cytoplasmic region of the ryanidine receptor, um, cause the channel to be leaky, as I mentioned about the the toilet being leaky, that results in the calcium levels leaking out of the store into the cytoplasm and they actually then bind to proteins or get transported out of the cell. So then you don't have very much water in the tank or calcium in the store to release calcium and to cause contraction. So we need to figure out a way to prevent that leak. That's, a, that's an intervention, that's a drug. If we could find a drug that could prevent this leak, that would be a good therapy. There are other mutations, particularly ones that we found in the pore region of the channel that actually don't produce leak. They actually make the channel less likely to release calcium. Um, the stores are still full of calcium, but it's kind of like with the toilet, if you took the pipe uh, underneath the Rhine receptor into the, into the bowl and made it really, really narrow, and then you opened that plug, it would take a long time for the water to come out and fill the bowl. And that's what we think some of these pore mutations do is affect the flux of the ions through that, that pipe. Um, another way of thinking of this is in recessive RYR1 disorders where you have very few ryanidine receptors, then you're going to actually have very little calcium release because you don't have many of those pores to release calcium. In both of those cases, the stores will be normal, but the, the, the ability to release that calcium is different. And in this case, a drug that blocks leak is not going to really help this person. A, blood that, a drug that blocks leak is going to help this person. So that's where personalized medicine comes in, knowing what mutation you have, how those mutations actually affect the calcium signaling and the way the muscle works, and then tailoring the drugs to, uh, uh, to impact that. And the last slide or two, I just want to kind of mention that it's even more complicated than that. Um, these mutations, um, if we just take leaky channels, um, that have uh, increased calcium leak. Uh, a number of elegant studies from uh, Andy Marks and Susan Hamilton uh, and others have shown that this increase in calcium leak uh, indeed increases the myoplasmic calcium, uh, but that increases oxidative stress, and so the muscle has increased oxidative stress. And that oxidative stress changes, uh, oxidizes proteins and changes their functions, and one of those proteins that gets oxidized is actually the ryanidine receptor. And when it gets oxidized, it becomes even more leaky. So you get this vicious myopathic cycle of calcium leak, oxidative stress, and greater calcium leak. And together, these things create a my myopathy because the calcium and the oxidative stress is damaging to the muscle. So the interventions that we've been uh, approaching up to this point are to come up with drugs that inhibit the leak or drugs that inhibit the oxidative stress. And if we can do that, then we, we hope that we can reduce the, the, um, the, the damage, the myopathy. So if we take one of these leaky channels, the therapeutic approaches that you may have heard about that um, the subsequent speakers are going to talk about are antioxidants. They reduce oxidative stress. That's what NAC does, and that's what the NIH clinical trial is based on this idea that the antioxidants will help to reduce this, this coercive cycle of, of oxidative stress and calcium leak. And then uh, Dr. Marks will talk about uh, RICALS and their company that, uh, uh, that have been investigating these as inhibiting the calcium leak as another approach. And indeed, these two drugs could be synergistic. 
based on the model I said before, uh, if they're both validated independently, potentially they could be synergistic. And they work by reducing reactive oxygen species and reducing leak to try to convert this leaky channel to a normal channel. And in the future, we'll, and I think there's another talk that will be touched on, is um, the possibility that uh, personalized medicas, and I think um, Karsten had mentioned mutation-specific gene silencing, where you try to use uh, oligonucleotides to silence just the dominant mutant allele. Uh, or we can also potentially use CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to correct the, the mutation that's either a dominant or a recessive mutation. So those are clearly in the distant future, but uh, in the research lab, they're being pursued. So the final answer uh, to how do these uh, mutations work, they work by affecting the way in which RYR1 releases calcium, either by making them leaking and depleting the stores, or reducing the calcium exit, either through effects on the pore or by reducing the expression of the channel so that there's less calcium that can go, or less channels that calcium can go through. And the very last thing I'd like to do is to thank the RYR1 Fo Foundation for bringing all of us together in really a wonderful venue. And finally, our work over the years has been graciously supported by NIH, MDA, and the RYR1 Foundation.